Okay. Um, so the original audio didn't record, so we're talking nutrition and digestion. So when we talk about nutrition, one of the first things that we need to deal with is nutritional needs. <coughs> So here I'm asking, I'm asking the students if they could um, name any of the nutrients that you, they need to survive, and there turn out to be six of them. So they're talking, 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 and eventually we get to our list of six. I don't remember exactly what was being said. There was discussion going on. So first one is water, and we had. Well, the water is the easiest one to think of. Then you start thinking of other things. Eventually, they came up with carbohydrates and lipids and proteins. The last two are a little bit harder to come up with. Minerals and then the living minerals, which are vitamins. Obviously, you need to have all of these in order to survive. And they're used for various things throughout the body, depending on whatever the organism is. And if you actually are missing some, you are considered to be uh, undernourished or malnourished. When we think of undernourishment or malnourishment, it's actually a lot worse than... Like, oh, you're skinny. It's a, you have deficiencies and you're actually having metabolic issues. So when you start wondering questions about like, well, how many humans are undernourished? It's well over half. Just because you are overweight does not mean that you are well fed. It just means that you have an excess of calories. And how someone looks does not necessarily tell you whether or not they're properly nourished or not. So when we think of the vitamins, they are divided into two categories, the water-soluble and the water-insoluble. This top portion up here are the water-soluble vitamins. They are the B and C vitamins. Vitamin C is just vitamin C, ascorbic acid. But the V vitamins are known by a whole bunch of different names. And they have numbers like B2, B5, B6, B12. But usually they're known as by their other names, so that's what you would see found in ingredient lists like thiamine, riboflavin, niacin, panathenic acid, biotin, folic acid. B6 is usually just called B6, B12 is usually called B12. And one of the things that you'll notice about all of these, which I'll highlight in a moment, is a good chunk of them turn out to be involved with enzymes. So typically we associate the B vitamins as enzyme coenzymes, meaning there are components that are necessary in order to, to allow for enzymatic activation. Which means if you're deficient in that particular vitamin, whatever that particular bit of chemistry is, it does not happen and allow for ensuing issues. The only weirdo is B12. B12 is actually needed for red blood cell development. So if you are B12 deficient, you have a form of anemia. Vitamin C is known as um, an antioxidant. It's also necessary to make collagen. So if you are vitamin C deficient, you have a condition, or you could get a condition called scurvy. Um, you also see it in bones and other fun things. The fat-soluble vitamins are A, D, E, K, or DAKE, D-A-K-E, however you want to think of it. So those, some of them you've heard of, like vitamin A is um, for vision, vitamin D is for calcium absorption, Vitamin E, you probably haven't heard of. Um, it's an antioxidant, and vitamin K is for clotting. 
for the fat soluble actually for a lot of vitamins usually if you're curious where you can find it bright green leafy vegetables brighter the colors usually the smarter it is When we think of minerals that we need, there's a whole bunch of really big famous ones. So these include calcium, obviously for bones. We also need it for intracellular movement, so um, skeletal muscle contractions, it's need for neurotransmitter release. Phosphorus is needed for DNA and ATP. Sulfur is for protein. Potassium, chloride, sodium. Obviously, we've seen those from how neurons work. Magnesium is actually a coenzyme. So it's necessary for anything involving ATP. So all ATP synthesis and all ATP hydrolysis requires magnesium ions. We have these other three, like iron. When you think of iron, that's for hemoglobin, but also for the electron transport chain. Iodine, we associate with T3 and T4, those thyroid hormones. Fluorine turns out not to be one that we normally need to consume. It's a neurotoxin but we associate it with drinking water because we fluoridate it to kill off bacteria and we also have it for our teeth. So when it comes to feeding, there are four main ways that you're gonna put food inside of your body. And this is about when um, I realized that I wasn't recording sound. So filter feeders, you could think of baleen whales. Also, a lot of worms turn out to do this. Animals that just kind of drift. They don't necessarily hunt. It's whatever sticks to them. That's what they'll go with. So a lot of cnidarians turn out to be this way. Also, sponges. Never forget the sponges. Bulk feeders are when you put the food inside of your body, either in one bite or through chomps. This is about the time I then realized, wait a second, I'm not recording any sound. Who else besides alligators? Yeah, people. In two days' time, you're going to witness this. Or somehow, you're going to have some parent or grandparent or a combination of the said individuals who will spend ungodly numbers of hours assembling a feast meant to serve and feed a village of 70 for a month, and yet you will consume it all within the span of 15 minutes. We are most assuredly bulk feeders. It would be. Oh, yeah. So, substrate. These are ones that just kind of move on through a surface. So they just move through. They're not, it's whatever shows up, process it through the mouth, get rid of what's not necessary, let's keep what's good. So it depends on the worm. But if you were to say something like an earthworm, that would definitely count. Where they just move on through, dirt moves on through their digestive tract from one end to the other, and they pull out what they need. You have what they show here, caterpillars on leaves. They just munch on through. Then you have fluid feeders. Mmm. 
So everyone likes to think of mosquitoes. Who else? Very famous one that does this. One more time. Leechwood. Spiders definitely do. They liquefy you, then suck you out. Butterflies will with nectar, yeah. If we're looking at the adult stage, yes. So caterpillars, juvenile stage. So these are just how they put nom noms into them. What version are you in terms of trophisms? That's a different story. You can be a carnivore and fit into any of those three feeding strategies. You can be an herbivore and fit into those feeding strategies. You can be an omnivore and fit into those feeding strategies. You can be a saprivore. Saprivore. No, deet. That's, that's not the word. Eat the dead parts or the decaying parts? Would be a saprivore. Then, of course, we have our very famous animal parasites. What are we? We're omnivores. Are we pure omnivore, or should we be leaning towards one side? Because if we're leaning towards one side, which side should we lean on? Our digestive tract is for herbivores. Our teeth are for herbivores. The enzymes we produce scream herbivore. The problem is... Moo cow is really tasty. And so is piglet. Just saying. It's not the best for us, though. Every once in a while, good, but do you actually know what a serving of meat is supposed to be? Like how big it is? It's take your hand and chop away your fingers and your thumb. It's the palm of your hand. That's one serving of meat. That's how much you should have a week. A week. I know, some of you are like, but that's the appetizer. That, that's the first bite. What do you do with the second bite? Anyway. How do we pull off being parasites? Well, the most famous of these, of course, are the worms. They can show up in many, many forms. So, right here we have an eye worm. Manifests in um, eyes. This bottom one here is an American original. That's a hookworm. This one here, it's a fun one. It's supposed to be very painful when they are ready to emerge because they rip a hole into your skin. So what this uh, volunteer is doing is grab, has grabbed the worm and is wrapping it around a pencil. And what you have to do is slowly pull it out because if you don't slowly pull it out, it will snap and the rest of it will dig itself back on in. It's called a guinea worm. I don't know if you still can, but you used to be able to get them in Puerto Rico. So technically, in America. Obviously, they don't just go after humans. So this is your TikTok viral sensation. You remember, for those of you who have watched those videos, what that worm is called? It reminds the, the people who found them that this looks like a horse hair. 
It's called a horsehair worm. You can find them all over the place. I remember my first year teaching, uh, having one brought to me, because someone was like, I need a biologist. It's like, and I was teaching chemistry at the time. And so I was like, well, I, I majored in this. So, you know, sure, bring it on by. And the person was like, I don't know what this is. And I'm like, that looks like a horsehair worm. He's like, yeah. So remember, this is the palm of the hand. If you had enough of these, literally, it looks like a ball of hair of them, except that they're all wiggling. They're almost all exclusively parasitic. So this came out of that. Almost all insects you find probably have horsehair worms. At least if they're the ones that like to gnaw on grass or uh, any type of vegetable stuff. So if you've ever seen a praying mantis, guaranteed they have several inside of them. How would you test this? Grab them by the tweezers, stick their butt end into water, and just wait. It won't be long, and you'll just watch this emerging out of this. We could have some that happen to love us. So this is a fluke. In particular, this is called a urinary fluke, but likes your urinary bladder. This would be a blood smear. All of these dots you see around the worms, these are eosinophils. Eosinophils, not perfectly, but they're one of our big immune components exclusively for worms. They do other things, but if you're going to attack a worm, it's the eosinophils that do, do the job. We have five types of white blood cells, and 20% of them are exclusive to worms. Worms are a huge issue. These ones here are flatworms, so these ones just go after urinary bladder. You can have them that go after blood vessels, and they're called blood flukes. They can occlude blood vessels, and congratulations, blood flow just stops. Um, you can also get them in your stomach. You can get them inside of your heart. You can get them all over the place. You can get some of them, well, not necessarily the flukes, although I wouldn't be surprised if it happens. You can get them in your brain. They're not supposed to be there, but they can. How would you know that you get a worm in your brain? you start having things like seizures and mood disruption and stuff like that. How do you get them out? Crack your skull open, pull it out. And then things go back to normal. They're not going to eat anything there. They're just shoving everything out of the way. For all these types of worms, especially like the flukes, the way they get in is they burrow themselves through your skin. And it leaves little rash marks. How do you get them into you? The water. So much so that those rashes are referred to as swimmer's itch because it's how they get on through. Some obviously will go through skin or uh, arms. Usually for most of the world, it's through your feet. How to go in through your feet? Because you're walking through water because that's where you need to grow your crops. How'd they get through your shoes? What shoes? What luxury planet do you live on where everyone has shoes? As you then think of how many pairs of shoes you admitted to having the first lab of the class. Sometimes we can be parasites for love. So you have met this fish before because you all saw Finding Nemo. This is the scary one in the deep. This is an anglerfish, one of the several types. They are usually pretty hideous when you actually get to see what they look like. They're in the dark. It's really hard to like find food. And it's even harder to find your ooh-la-la, your lover. Typically with fish, the females are going to be much larger than the males. And in the dark, 
not only is it hard to find your ooh la 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 there, but you need to like find each other and stick around. So the anglerfish have a solution. Here's a uh, daddy anglerfish and here's mama anglerfish. He has penis and he says, here you go. And then he remains stuck. And then her body then says, okay, thank you very much for the sperm. I'm just going to hold the rest of you attached to me. And they become fused. In a sense, he becomes a parasite to the mama. But, you know, we're so awesome, we can have parasites that get parasites themselves. So, obviously, a mosquito, this looks like it would be an Anopheles. So, Anopheles mosquitoes are the ones that can transmit malaria. Malaria is good stuff. We love ourselves some malaria. Clearly, she's having such a good time that the blood is even erupting out of her. She's having such a good feed. So, what makes this entertaining is malaria in a sense is a parasite to the mosquito and a parasite to us so one of our parasites transmits a parasite of the parasite to parasitize humans if you could follow that so we can have all sorts of like inception layers going on but we have other types of parasitism amongst the animals. The bird on the left is a parasite. The bird on the right doesn't know any better. Yes. It's called a brooding parasite. So the bird on the left is called a cuckoo bird. Uh, a cuckoo, uh, the cuckoo bird. And what it does is it will lay an egg. So the mom will fly to a nest of any other bird where the eggs of the other nest look similar to her egg. So whoop, plop it out. Okay, peace out, kid. Hope you have a good life. These birds tend to hatch faster than others. And the first instinct of the bird is to shuffle around in the nest until it can find another egg. Then it shows off, it can do squats, you know, it was just born, squats, backs up, and pushes the egg out. And we'll keep doing that until all the eggs are out of the nest. A lot of birds, they don't know what their offspring look like. They just know, they see that mouth, ah, and they go, I feed that mouth. So, the parasitism is this one, which is clearly a little bit well more well-fed than Mama turns out to be, it takes the place of these kids taking nutrition meant for its genetic lineage, but it is the one that's taking over. Animal parasitism is fun. I didn't feel obligated to show you all the eyeball bot flies because you've seen enough bot flies. I assume that you've seen the squirrels with bot fly all over their bodies. <gasps> Dr. Google, go fast. Quick, quick, quick. You want to look? Bot flies, squirrel. If any of you have trichophobia, you don't want to look. Trichophobia is the fear of like holes. You're welcome. Is that not the best thing you've ever seen? Right? You are so welcome. Okay, so how are we going to deal with getting nutrition in us? Everything shows up in four stages. 
And it's just a matter of how you wish to parse these out. First step is ingestion. Get the food in the mouth or into the cavity. Step two, break it down or digest. Step three is you need to take in the good stuff, absorb the nutrients. Last step is you need to ingest or defecate out that which you cannot digest. This occurs in the alimentary canal. You call it the GI tract. GI, gastrointestinal. Some animals have what we call a gastrovascular cavity instead. In this particular case here, the mouth and the anus are one. Name me an animal that has a gastrovascular cavity. So sea jellies. Sponges do not. They actually have a one-way flow. So hydra, so cnidarians. So so would corals. Any others? Some of the flatworms do this. And there's another one. Another big group. We're kind of partial to them because they're the only other deuterostomes with us. Deuterostomes. I don't remember that word. Or you do remember that word. You're like, what does that mean? Deuterostome. Mouth second. The so chordates and the... It starts with an E. It's a great word. That means spiny skin. The echinoderms. So give me an example of an echinoderm. So a sea star. Or a sea urchin. Or a sea lily. Or a sand dollar. All those one way in and out. Or two way, excuse me. Everything else, we're going to have a passageway all the way through. When we look at the development, in order to have this passageway that goes from one end to the other, we need to end up having a body cavity that shows up. So for the most part, there are some exceptions to this, but for the most part, these are all organisms that have a... triple blastic body plan. They have three sets of tissues that generate what they are. So if you were to diagram it out, they would have an outside that we call the ectoderm. They're going to have an inner layer that we're going to call the endoderm. And then they're going to have a layer in between. That indeed is called the mesoderm. But the mesoderm typically splits into two chunks. The space in between is called the coelom or the body cavity. And that's where all your organs go. Let's put the nom noms inside of you. First step, pretty easy. Put the food in your mouth. Got it. However you need to do that, you do you, boo. The process of putting it in, especially for the bulk feeders, there's two types of steps that you need to take. One of them is what we call a mechanical digestion. 
The job of mechanical digestion, crush smaller. Why do you need to crush it smaller? To decrease its size. Why do you need to decrease its size? To increase the surface area to volume ratio. Which is going to be necessary later. You typically have issues with your digestion if you fail at mechanical digestion. If you fail to make the food as small as possible, issues arise later, namely food poisoning. The other type of digestion that occurs is chemical digestion. Chemical digestion is based upon enzymes. It's also going to be heavily regulated, meaning you'll have different types of chemical digestion in different parts of the digestive system. Where does mechanical digestion begin? in your mouth, where does it end? In the stomach. So your stomach is going to be involved with both. Or, sorry, you'll have mouth as mechanical digestion, stomach mechanical digestion. Where do we begin chemical digestion? In your mouth. Because you have saliva, and part of your saliva will break down, or at least start to break down food. Mechanical digestion is mouth and stomach. Chemical digestion is mouth, stomach, and your small intestines. At least the start of your small intestines. It's not the entire thing. It's the, the start of it. The duodenum. They have a different job to play. Sometimes you're going to consume food that you cannot digest. So you might have mutualists that live in your gut. So these will be microbes in the gut. Gut, of course, is just a generic junk term for stomach and intestines. that aid in chemical digestion. How many stomachs do, or do cows have? People will usually give you an answer of four. They have a four-part stomach. Do they really have, or sorry, they'll say that they have four stomachs. Do they? No, they have one stomach. But different areas of the stomach will specialize in different parts. And what you'll see is some parts, they'll find more mutualists than others. What do you typically see inside of a cow's stomach? They're going to grind the hay for a while with stomach acid to help break it down, and they'll have some bacteria in there. They're then going to move it to a different part to see how liquidy it is, test it, and then go back to re, to re going through. Sometimes they'll spit it back up, so they regurgitate it. There's a word for when they regurgitate it called a rumen, which is why those are, types of animals are called ruminants. They spit back up what was in their stomach. Why? So they can chew it some more, put it back in, and try again. And you're going to keep doing this until eventually it's liquidy enough to go into the small intestine. So it's 
process in the stomach, spit it back up to your throat, into your mouth, chomp, 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 some more, swallow it again, keep going. Be mindful if you walk up to a cow and they want to give you a kiss. Inside of your stomach is where we begin to notice some fun stuff. I have to give this back, sorry. If you lose your, completely lose your sense of smell, tell me about your desire to eat. It doesn't decrease, it stops. If you cannot taste your food, you will not eat it. Your tummy will tell you that you are starving to death. You will take a bite and you'll say, no. Is it important to actually have food that is tasty? Yes. If it, food does not have taste, you will not eat. One of the things that you all will unfortunately have to deal with if you have not dealt with it already is someone dying from cancer. One of the things that tends to show up with cancer, and we don't know why, is called tumor cachexia. Why am I not writing this down? Because I can't spell the word cachexia. I just know the word. It means you lose your ability to taste food, which is why you will notice that with a good chunk of people who have cancer, they just stop eating. If you ask them why, they're like, it doesn't taste good. Why? Because they can't even taste the food. And if you can't taste it, you will not eat it. No matter how hungry you are, you will not eat it. Second fun fact. If you cannot produce saliva, you cannot swallow. It's been said that per bite, you would need to drink the equivalent of a gallon of water if you don't produce saliva. So imagine that. Every bite, you drink a gallon of water, one of those big old jugs. That's because you can't swallow otherwise. Because we have proteins inside of our saliva that help make it slick so it goes on down so if you were to get throat cancer or salivary gland cancer you're not going to swallow ever again you will not eat for the rest of your life because you just can't once we get to your stomach we're going to notice some things namely this evolutionary pattern of form implies function what we will notice about your stomach is it has three layers of smooth muscle. We have not spoken about smooth muscle. This is all you're going to get from smooth muscle. Smooth muscle is kind of like heart muscle, cardiac muscle, in that it can function as one. It's just not as controllable. It just happens on its own. The motion of smooth muscle contraction is called peristalsis, which coincidentally is how you swallow. You trigger the swallow with your tongue. If you actually pay attention to your tongue when you swallow, it's going to creep you out when it does because it's actually a super coordinated motion that you were never aware that you learned how to do, especially because your tongue is controllable. But if you swallow and just pay attention to your tongue, especially if you pay attention to how you eat and pay attention to your tongue, it's creepy. And how your tongue moves when it sw when you swallow, it's also creepy. Food never falls into your stomach. It gets pushed down. It's why you can swallow an ice cube and you feel you don't feel it like just go you know, in the back of your throat and then suddenly it's gone. You feel the cold slowly descend down your throat. Because it's being shoved down. You have no open tubes in your body except for your airways. Everything else is collapsed, which means food needs to be pushed to push the tube open and then it slams shut again. So every picture you've ever seen or video of food falling in, or like, oh, yes, your stomach's a vat, vat of acid and it's a phew and it falls on in. Nope, not like that at all. It's going to be a Ziploc bag. Squeeze all the air out, and you have to force stuff on in. That's what it looks like. So it's three layers of muscles. Why? 
We have muscles that go up and down. We have muscles that go side to side. And then we have muscles that wrap around at an angle. Reason for it, you need in your stomach. You all know kneading, yes? If you don't know kneading, you need to work in a kitchen more. Make a pie crust or something. So when you knead the dough where you don't move it in one direction, you're just squishing from all sides, that's what goes on in your stomach. First thing, so we have these three layers, so this kneading stuff must be important. Second thing we're going to notice is it has lots of folds. Why would you have lots of folds? Increase the surface area. If you increase surface area, you increase your, we don't know if that's the case, but at least we know you increase function. Increase surface area, increase function. What you'll notice is in these folds is we have these things that are called crypts. So we get these divots into the stomach lining. And inside of here, we're going to have a whole bunch of different types of cells. What these cells are going to do is secrete enzymes, stomach acid, which is done by a very ingenious reaction that we don't talk about here, and mucus. This mucus has no O. So here it says a mucus cells. That's because it's the layer. The substance they produce is mucus, no O. Because that's the snot stuff. Clearly, we need to do a good job at secreting a lot of this, which is why we have a lot of surface area. Enzymes, I get. Hydrochloric acid, why? So it's going to help with digestion. We call that hydrolysis. But it also has a secondary function. It's a sterilizing agent. The food you're eating is not sterile. And you're putting it, putting that food into a warm, hot, humid, dark place, which is where all microbes desire to be. So what we have to do is kill off as many of the things as we possibly can. And at last check, a dip into stomach acid might do the trick. Which is also why you need to chew your food. Because chewing your food makes it smaller. Making it smaller increases the surface area to volume ratio, which makes it easier for the stomach acid to sterilize the food. If you just go big bite, swallow, big bite, swallow, you'll sterilize the surface before you run it, before you get a chance to really do a good job and it washes on out. So you're more likely to introduce pathogens on into your body and thus get some type of food poisoning. It's usually not because, oh no, the place you ate at is dangerous. It's because you're an idiot. Just saying. Now, if you're getting like a weird salmonella thing, that's also someone needs to learn to wash hands. Just saying. Just, just saying. Could be you, but also could be whoever prepared the food. Last two steps. We need to absorb the food. Absorption is primarily done in your small intestine. Your small intestine is actually divided into three sections. It's the last two sections that kind of do the absorption part. What you'll see inside of your small intestine is they have lots of these large folds. So we get these large folds inside your small intestine. What we'll then see is if you look on these folds, we'll see the cells 
that also make these little ridges. And then if I look on the cells themselves, they have cilia. They'll be ciliated. The point of all of this, of a fold, it has these ridgy sets of cells, and each of the cells have cilia, is, of course, surface area. to increase function. What are we going to do? We need to absorb as much as we possibly can. Here we will have some chemical digestion. This is going to be done by things called the brush border enzymes. The brush border, if you were to look at the intestines, it kind of, it's combed. So it kind of looks like a bunch of brush combs. So along the surface of it, we call it the brush border. So there's enzymes that are found on the edges of these folds. And they're going to do last second digestion. Because there's lots of stuff being shoved through here, and it's going to fill up the entire space, these cells tend to get fluffed off all the time. So inside your stomach that happens, in your mouth that happens. In here, it definitely happens. Which means if we had to beg for a place for there to be cancer, here's a good place. Your mouth, your stomach, your small intestine, your large intestine. Any place where we have lots of stuff sloughing past it, we're going to lose the cells and we got to replace them. Replacing the cells is begging for cancer. It's why brain cancer isn't a huge thing. Because you're not constantly replacing them. Same thing with your eyeball. You're not replacing eyeball cells. How do we absorb the food? We're going to use a combination of primary and secondary active transport. So we're either going to use a pump drag the food in or we're going to use sodium or potassium and use that to drag the food in some of these are going to be complicated i'll show you what it looks like on the next slide but we're going to pull off whatever tricks we can to absorb everything which is why worms love our intestinal tract because there's a lot of good stuff going on through one of the pictures I wanted for the parasites, but I was like, ah, all the good photos were like trapped in videos. I'm like, I'm not going to watch this thing and then like hope that it freezes correctly so I can then do a screen capture. Like, I, I don't think so. Have you seen the isopods that replace fish tongues? Dr. Google. So you want... An isopod, so I-S-O-P-O-D, then fish tongue. Enjoy that one. So eventually we'll get to your large intestine. What are we going to do there? Your large intestine have lots upon lots upon lots of bacteria. If we start counting how many cells you have in your body, Typically, you need to say, are we talking total cells or your cells? Because about half of the cells of your body are bacteria. That's, you have unfathomable numbers of bacteria inside of your large intestine. The vast majority of them appear to be mutualistic with us. They don't seem to want to come out and kill us. They seem to thoroughly enjoy the food we bring them. They help us by digesting some things and producing some vitamins for us. So we say, thank you. They also seem to be protective of us and they seem to kill off bacteria that would hurt us. So we do seem to have a rather nice arrangement. There is increasing evidence that they help make compounds that influence your mood. So they are playing a role in your mental health. There's also evidence that says that they are helpers in helping your immune system 
know what is good and what is bad. So they seem to do a lot for us. All that said, the moment we're dead, game on. <laughs> and they will be very fast to help decompose us. It's also why, if you've never seen the videos or pictures of things at the beach that look like this giant beach ball, with all these weird stretch marks on them, they are whale carcasses that are about ready to explode. And you run away from them as fast as you can because it's going to kill you if you are in the vicinity. Have you ever heard of a whale called a right whale? Why is it called a right whale? Because there are, are there left whales? No, there are no such thing as left whales, but there are right whales. So right, why is it called a right whale? Because those are the right whales to kill. Because most whales, if you kill them, they sink which is good for ecosystems at the bottom of the ocean. But if you kill the right whale, it floats. So they're the ones that you want to kill if you're killing whales, because they float. Not that you should be killing whales. That's a different story. What do we do inside your large intestine? It's there primarily to reabsorb all that water, because enzymes are in something. So we need to suck all that stuff back out. It's also where we need to reclaim all those electrolytes. It's why when you have diarrhea, we worry about you becoming dehydrated and having an electrolyte imbalance. Because diarrhea is when you hit flush in the large intestine. And the catch is that's where you reabsorb the salts in the water. Your appendix. Tell me about this appendix. Usually the first thought is it's useless. That is an idea that has been debunked 20 plus years ago. And yet it's still what people think. Your appendix is a bacterial storehouse. What you see is after you have a bout of diarrhea, the appendix starts to contract. And it repopulates your, small, your large intestine, excuse me, with the bacteria that you need in there. It's why it can get infected, because, oops, it got a little runaway with its population, and the result is it gets inflamed, and you have appendicitis. What we tend to notice is people who lose, who need to have their appendix removed, they tend to have more digestive issues. They tend to get more diarrheal encounters. And it's because you lost your storage vessel of all the good bacteria. Which is why we don't chop out appendix, appendices as much anymore. It has to be really bad for us to take it out. We do not digest everything the same way. Carbohydrates, we start in the mouth and we end in the small intestine. Proteins are a bit more difficult, so we start in the stomach and we end in the small intestine. Fats. We actually kind of start in the stomach, and there's a little bit of activity in the mouth, but there's not much. The bulk of fat digestion is in your small intestine. This actually requires help from the gallbladder. If you do not have a gallbladder, it is much more difficult to digest fats. Gallbladder produces the sub the substance that we call bile, and bile is an emulsifying agent. So emulsify is when you can mix fat into water. So that's like making mayonnaise and stuff like that. If you lose your gallbladder, it's much harder. You get droplets of fat. You can't really digest those droplets of fat. They're also kind of dangerous. 
you tend to get more diarrhea because large chunks of fat are moving on into the bacteria and the bacteria say, thank you. This is such a treat. And hooray. Yes. But there's no direct path. Yes. So if you lose your gallbladder, there's no direct pathway from liver out. So it's effectively gone. The small intestine is meant, if you look at us and our digestive system, we have a very long small intestine. And it's long enough because it takes a while to digest plant material. So you have to give it as much time as possible. Protein digests fast. The catch is, we're now taking this stuff that's basically digested, and we're leaving the waste behind in an area where it's just slowly moving, which is one of the reasons why it has been put forth that meat can cause cancer, especially red meat, because it's hanging out too long. How could you minimize it? Eat fiber. Why? Because fiber will grab on to all the stuff that probably isn't good for you. It also makes it so it gets flushed out easier. So if you want to sit there and eat your moo cow for seven, okay, have a pound of sweet potatoes too. Don't eat the salad. The salad is a waste of calories, especially because you're just eating it because you like the dressing and the dressing is just fat. Have veggies, like real veggies, not leaves. Fat absorption is complicated. So fats, what we do is we digest them into triglycerides, which will then break apart into its components. You absorb the individual parts, and then inside of the cell, you just reassemble it. We just kind of decompose it just to put it back together again. It's a very odd process. Obviously, we have some variations on this. Four minutes. You have different shaped teeth for different purposes. So the shape usually tells you about chewing versus tearing. Different organisms will have different numbers of teeth. We are kind of strange in that you, we only go through two rounds of teeth. Lots of other animals go through multiple rounds of teeth. And we're like, you get one set, then you get two sets, then good luck. Don't ruin them. Remember to floss. Which I was reminded of. Because this morning I went to the dentist. Yay. It's the same dental office I've been, I've gone to since I was four. Yes. Even though the dentist has retired, who I went to, but he hand-selected the person who would take over the office, who is still there. She has my dental records of when I was four. Yeah, it's weird seeing like, Oh, that's that's an old piece of paper. <laughs> anyway, uh, we've talked about the stomach and microbiome. I've told you about the intestinal length. Longer it is, harder it's going to be to digest. Hooray. Why do hippos, speaking of hippos from earlier, 
Why do they have those big old long useless tusks? And they have like four teeth. Because their tusks are teeth, but you don't ever see them eating with them. Whenever one of those weird things shows up, the answer is always competition. It's always competition. So it's for fighting. So why do elephants have tusks? Because clearly they're teeth, but they're not there necessarily to eat. So it must be for competition. How about a narwhal? Narwhal has a big old long incisor, grows through its skull, shoots on out. But it's a tooth. What's it good for? Fighting. It's always for competition. Whenever one of these weird things shows up. Uh, yeah. Oh! Why does the koala spend so much of its time sleeping? So why about the digest? It's even better than that. Eucalyptus leaves are toxic. They're actually toxic. And if you can lower your metabolism, it's easier to get around the toxins. You know anything else that sleeps a whole bunch? Sloths. And if you look at what they eat, the leaves are primarily toxic. Lowering your metabolism and thus sleep a lot is a very good strategy to avoid toxicity. The problem is you have to be in an area where you're hopefully not going to get eaten either. So yeah. Uh, we dealt with their stomach. Uh, gut microbiome, we don't know anything about it. We're, we're trying. Gut microbiome is important. There. That's an accent mark.